Hey, everybody. I'm Elizabeth Alfano, host of the Plant-Based Business Hour. I am so happy to have you with me because today we are talking about honey without the bee. Now, is that possible? And why would you ever want to do that? Let's go and find out. I have with me today from San Francisco, uh, Darko Mandich, who's the co-founder and CEO of MeliBio. Darko, thanks for being with me. Thanks for having me, uh, Elizabeth. So excited to be here today to talk about bees, honey, and melibio. Yes, so happy to have you. Okay, so let's get into it because there's so much I want to talk to you about. First of all, tell everybody, what is melibio and why are you making honey without bees? Um, it's a great question. And I would say that melibio is first and foremost, the better future. And that better future is only better for humans if it is better for animals. And our specific animal that we really care as a company about are the bees. So we believe that Melibio is creating a better future where we keep our bees alive and we use science to make our honey, make our real honey um, accessible to everyone on this planet. Yeah. Okay. Before we start talking about the life of bees and the 23 thousand, I believe, different species of bees. We're not going to hit all 20,000 today, but just to show you, you know, it's more than the honeybee that exists. And I actually didn't know that before researching to prepare for this interview. Before we talk about the life of bees, let's first talk a little bit about your background. You are not new to the honey industry, but you are making a new addition to the honey industry, but you have a long history here. What made you decide, oh, there's got to be a better way for honey? Um, this is my 10th year uh, in the honey industry. However, the first eight years, I've been part of a traditional honey industry. I've been working for the biggest European companies in um, selling honey that's made through commercial beekeeping that honeybees made. And I was selling that uh, product in 15 countries across the world, including the United States. And uh, I can definitely say that I'm a honey industry whether or not. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Well, so you're, you're making honey in the industry or you're selling it, excuse me. And what did you learn in that industry that made you think, I don't want to be a part of this industry anymore. In fact, I want to be a solution to this industry. I always felt that whatever I want to do and work needs to have a positive impact. So in 2012, I joined the honey industry because I care about bees and because I love uh, you know, spending time with food. I come from the Southeast European region where food really connects people. I remember one of the first memories is, you know, my family having a small restaurant in the, close to a Dalmatian coastline. And, you know, I always remember people coming uh, and having food at our home. So food really meant a lot to me. So I joined uh, the honey industry believing that there's a great product out there and great animals. And those two beliefs, Elizabeth, are still there. I believe that honey is a great product, and I believe that bees are amazing and wonderful creatures. However, what happened there to you know disconnect this and kind of inspire me to change the very industry that I've been building is this shocking uh, finding of the true story about bees. That happened when, I, I remember it was a Saturday, afternoon I was in Serbia back in Europe and I was reading articles about bees and there was this article in a uh, Wired magazine that goes like you are worrying about wrong bees and I was I was really shocked I was like what's what's wrong bees what, what's that and at that moment I realized that beyond honeybees the only bees that we talk about in media and campaigns there are 20,000 wild and native bees that are unheard and you know, that article inspired me to look into other studies and to learn the true story of all the bees out there. Okay, so I'm following you so far, but I do wanna know more. So you're learning that, okay, there's more than just the honeybee and that there are 20,000 different species of bees, but what's the problem with commercial farming of honeybees? And, and what's even the relationship to, let's say the honeybee and the pollinating bee. The honeybee does pollinate, but 
it's, it's I, I, I mean, I, I read the B report and I constantly, I uh, would like to remind everyone to go to mellybio.com and look at the B report because it's very informative things I didn't know yesterday. I now know today, which is so wonderful, but I want to share that with everyone today. Tell us how commercial farming of honeybees is harming pollinator bees and why that made you want to switch. So first of all, honeybees that are, you know, heavily used in pollination and in honey production First of all, they don't like that, what we are doing to them. So if we were just talking about honeybees right now, you know, they're being smoked when, you know, beekeepers approach them. Uh, they're being kept in, you know, tiny boxes in warehouses, you know, like millions of them at the, at the same place. And if there's like a, you know, pathogen spillover that can, you know, affect many honeybees across beehives, then, you know, what's a standard in the honey production, unfortunately, is that, when the honey harvest is completed, beekeepers want to take almost everything what's inside the beehive because they have this great incentive to sell it as an expensive ingredient. So what happens is that honeybees are left without food. So what they do to them, they mix them in a sugary cocktail of table sugar and water, and beekeepers give that to bees so that they can survive until the next springtime and uh, next crop. So those conditions out there are far from exciting. And the, because of all those conditions, you know, honey made by the bees is not considered vegan. So again, honey is not considered vegan. Honey is not plant-based because there's an animal involved in this process that is being heavily utilized by, by humankind so that they work for, you know, our cause of having this, you know, awesome product. On the other side, what's happening is that we found this species called honeybees. In 19th century, Mr. Lorenzo Langstroth, um, American priest from Pennsylvania and inventor, invented this um, specific um, portion of a beehive that helped, you know, that helped introduce more beehives out there called Langstroth beehives that are widely used today. So that was a big move on the efficiency side. But what happened today is that we started loving honey, which, you know, is great. But in order to make it and in order to satisfy the demand for it, we started breeding more and more honeybees. And those honeybees, when they're introduced into a habitat where they were not before or into a habitat where they were before, but in smaller numbers, they become like, um, I would say they become aggressive towards wild and native bee species. There's like 20,000 of them, 4,000 live in the United States. So these honeybees push back on wild and native bees because they, they are, you know, supported by humans. They come in a bigger number and they just take all the food for themselves so that the, these wild and native bees, they don't have a chance to survive. They don't have a chance. Okay, so I think what you're saying is that these commercial farmed bees then push or put pressure on the native bees and the native bees don't survive. So you're having fewer and fewer native bees. Why would we care if we have all these commercial bees? Yeah, that's that's a question that I exact, the exact question I got from one investor. So if we have got enough honeybees, um, are we doing okay? And we just you know don't care about wild and native bees. So the problem there is that while the native bees are different pollinators than honeybees, they pollinate native plants. They don't choose as honeybees choose, and they are really important for our planet. There, there are sayings that if we would lose our wild and native bee species, our planet would lose, you know, the, the would lose the sceneries that we have today and start looking like a pure desert or like a surface of Mars. And you know, we looked into these. Um, you know, articles, and we compile them in, into the State of the Bees report that we published on our website, where we explain this complicated relationship between wild and native bees. Um, let's not think that, you know, we don't need honeybees. Let's not think that, you know, we should get rid of all the honeybees. But what we're saying here is that the balance has been distorted, that we came to the point where National Geographic this January reported that a quarter of wild and native bee species haven't been seen in the last decade, meaning that they're rapidly dying. Coming to that level, 
we're jeopardizing not only the future of you know bees but also our future on this planet because you know how are we going to live on this planet if it's just a you know pure pure desert um you know the beauty of this planet is you know all these sceneries that we have all these forests all these meadows and we want to keep that and we believe that you know you can have honey is an awesome product it's a food that bees make for themselves you know and we believe that science can help us still having this awesome product every single day but to produce it in a sustainable way that saves the bees so I want to recap a little bit of what you said just so that everyone can take this away because I was having a conversation with a beekeeper the other day and he said, well, what are you talking about? If you start making uh, plant-based honey or a fermented, we're going to get into this, how you do it, but a precision fermentation honey, then you have no bees. And without bees, you basically don't have food. I mean, bees pollinate everything. And I said, I don't have the answer for you, but I'm going to find out on October 5th when I talk to a uh, co-founder and CEO of Melibio, Darko Mandich, why the commercial farming of honeybees isn't sustainable. So it puts this pressure on the native uh, species. And these native species are actually better pollinators. They pollinate more and more rapidly, as I understand it from the bee report and from what you're saying here today. Um, and when the commercially farmed bees take over, they kind of crowd out the others. And so you're worried about not just the diverse population of bees, but the diverse population of what the bees pollinate. And for us, that would be our food. So um, you've got this, this consideration that the honeybees are more aggressive and kind of are invasive, basically an invasive species. But you also have the spread of disease. Can you talk to me about commercial farming and then what happens in this, you know, like all factory farming, right? It's just overpopulated. And so it's easy to transmit disease, whether that be African swine fever with pigs or uh, the uh, African honeybee or what have you, the European honeybee or, um, you know, crickets for that mm -hmm. matter, which is another show. But um, yes, yeah, so the factory farming can can give way to disease. Talk to me a little bit about that and what that means for bees and us. I mean, in in 2021, if anyone needs um, any any proof that you know intersection of of humans and animals at a level that we allow to happen, if anyone needs a proof that that's not the best way moving forward to yeah. to, to save the humankind, I don't know what to say to that. Um, very often, delivering the truth comes with a shock. I was personally very shocked when I found out about the other bees and about this connection. And I, you know, I, I challenged that. I looked into many articles beyond one, but it came, it perfectly came together after, you know, you make a connection with everything what we do. We as a humankind, we discovered something and then we find use to something. And then we start using, you know, then we introduce efficiency, new methods. And then we, at that moment, realize about the consequences of that. So I, I see, you know, like people started using honey all, all the way back to 6,500 years before Christ at the current territory of Azerbaijan and Georgia you know, between Europe and Asia. There are findings of honey in Egyptian pyramids, you know, like um, 2,000 years before Christ. And, and, you know, humans have this emotional connection with honey and bees. You know, take any religious books with any re religion in the world, you'll find honey in it, which is not the case for other foods. So this is a very, you know, interesting topic. It's a very emotional product. It's a very emotional story. And what I can say is that we need to look into the science. We need to look into the data. You, we need to realize what's happening out there. Because if we just decide that we live only within the narrative that was downloaded to us, be, be, in, in previous generations or, you know, or any, any other reasons or ways. And if we don't challenge that, we're going to be, you know, we're going to be having, having a problems. Unfortunately, um, only 2% of beekeepers are organic beekeepers. So to call that, uh, it is considered that organic beekeepers are treating bees a little bit better than commercial scale beekeeping, but that's only 2%. But, you know, Elizabeth, I would say, Look, look at all the amazing things that we accomplished as humankind. You know, look at the world today versus then what we had 
you know, in the past. And I'm wondering who has the right to stop the evolution, Elizabeth? Who has the right to say, we've been eating something coming from the animal for, you know, like decades or centuries. What if there is a better way? What if in order to survive on this planet, we need to win the game of adapting and, you know, using what we've built so far, which is knowledge and science into our own benefit. And, you know, this is what Melibio is. You know, we, I'm not a scientist. My co-founder is a scientist. I'm not a scientist. I, I went to business school and I'm coming from an entrepreneurial family that's really connected to the food. But I really believe that, you know, the more I discover science, the more I, you know, think about, you know, the plant-based route or the uh, precision fermentation, I see enormous opportunity to feed the world, to, to leave no one without food and to make that sustainably so that we keep this planet and these creatures alive. Yeah, I love what you're saying. Again, so much to unpack there. So, so much of what we talk about when we talk about a global shifting food supply system is food security and making sure that people, all the people, so that's a, almost 10 billion people by 2050, according to the UN. Now we're only at about 7.7 .7 billion people. So you're looking at almost 30% increase. So how are you going to feed all of those people? So as we look to a more efficient food supply system, what you're saying is you're trying to make sure that everybody gets the honey that they want and love. The Egyptians called it liquid gold. So who wants to give up on liquid gold? But we can't do so at the expense of the native species, which really we need as pollinators. So there are these two different, although there are 20,000 species, there are two different kinds of bees. The pollinators that are quite prolific and uh, allow us a prolific vegetation, if you will, and then the honeybees themselves. Um, so as you look to hopefully um, increase native bee populations, what is taking place out there to ensure that that happens, which ultimately, as we said before, means the survival of our own species as, you know, bees basically make sure we have food by pollinating. With every pound of honey that we substitute, that's currently coming from commercial beekeeping, that we substitute with science, we remove the need and work of 22,000 honeybees. With so every with, pound? With every pound of honey. So every single person, every single company that's using honey or sweeteners can directly support saving the bees by taking out a pound of honey and replacing it with honey made by science. And what can we do if we replace tens of billions of pounds? So there are a couple ways to look at this. It can be the push. So you're saying, hey, if you take out regular honey and you use, let's say, honey without the bee, you are, I wrote this down, 22,000, you are saving 22,000 bees, let's say, from commercial farming. But there's also the reverse, which is the pull in that regardless of what Meli Bio does today, and we do thank you for everything that you do, Native species are suffering from mass commercial agriculture in general. It's also pesticides, et cetera, which is pushing hard on native bee species. So you're seeing other things pop up in the industry like mechanical bees. I'm not even sure that's the right term. So mechanical bees that might pollinate and replace the bee. And if that happens, then you don't have your honey. So some we can't go into the, the rabbit hole and everything, but there are 20,000 different species of bees. Not all bees produce honey. Do I have that right, Darko? Yeah, that's that's correct. Okay, not all bees produce and honey. Only one species is actually used by humans um, to produce honey, which is, you know, Apis mellifera or European honeybee. The European, European honeybee. Um, but, but the pollinators, the native ones, they also produce honey. Is that right? Um, some of them can sporadically produce honey in smaller amounts. And you know what's really interesting, Elizabeth, that, you know, this honey story, I, I, I didn't mention, you know, 6,500 years ago and, and things like that, but only in 18th century, European honeybee came to uh, the territory of Northern America. Actually, Spanish conquistadors, they brought honeybees from Spain 
to the current territory of you know South America uh, and and moving them up to to North America. So basically, you know, we believe that this is all of this that we're doing right now is is part of evolution. You know, we discovered an amazing product. We discovered an animal. Unfortunately, or you know, things happen. We used it across thousands of years, and now we came to the point we're confident to use science to step in and, and help us. And not only us, but those bees too. Yeah. So it's wonderful. And so you're helping uh, the bees, but you're also helping people because if I understand this correctly, we're going to have to pull back on the commercial farming of the honeybee so that we can let the native bee species thrive for more pollination, which means people are getting less honey. So you're, you're helping the bees and you're also helping people get yeah. honey because with fewer commercial um, honeybees, then yeah. you have less honey and everybody wants their honey. Let's, let's be real. You know so, what's important there? We really want everyone to actually consume honey because we believe that there isn't a sweetener as sophisticated as honey is. But in order to make it available to everyone at a price that really makes sense, we need to be having an, an efficient way uh, to be producing it. That's also an important story uh, that comes to our venture besides the sustainability. In order for everyone to eat honey, we need to make it at scale. We need to make it safe because very often honey that you buy, even with known beekeepers at farmer's market, comes adulterated with pesticides because yeah. no, there isn't a beekeeper in the world that can guarantee that they know the entire perimeter of the flight of their honeybee. They can be visiting a neighboring sprayed orchard and pick up things, selling that jar for 30 bucks on a farmer's market. You'll be buying it thinking that you're doing something good, but you're just you know, consuming something that's adulterated. When we make that happen in a controlled environment, in a, in a factory setting, we are 100% certain that our honey is adulterant free and that, only, and that also babies can consume it which is not the case today because honey made by the bees contains bacteria called Clostridium, which makes it dangerous for babies because of, uh, it can cause botulism. With our honey, not having that bacteria inside, our honey is baby food safe. So, I mean, like all these amazing things taken into account, I don't see any reason why, you know, this should be done and that, you know, we should all wholeheartedly support uh, this new honey industry powered by science. Yeah, I love that. I just want to go ahead and share the B report, which is so good. And I want to show people this graphic, if I can find it, which I think is pretty amazing. And just give me a second, everybody. It's not here. Hold on. Um, I want to show the trucking industry and how what commercial farming does is it's commercial farming for honey. Then they take all the honey. Then the bees have a really tough time during winter. They're living on something suboptimal, which is like sugar water. They're living in, you can see here, these boxes that they're overcrowded. They don't like it. Uh, but, but in addition to making honey, bees are rented out to commercial farmers of agriculture to do pollinating, as I understand it. And they're trucked all of Darko. Do I have this right? They're trucked all over the country, which is why you're saying you don't know where those bees have been. Where have your bees been, right? Is, do I have that right, Darko? You have it perfectly right. Imagine all these bees on 18 haulers moved from uh, Atlantic Ocean, you know, all the way to Pacific across the country. Imagine what can happen in you know in in a, in a journey of a couple of thousand miles, and you know we really need to be aware that we are intersecting with animals, and you know that happening in previous cases didn't turn out to be very well and favorable for us as a humankind. I'm not saying that you know bees might be um, creating another pandemic. I'm not saying that. I'm not a vir virusologist, but I can say that definitely that we are getting exposed and intersected with animals and we're we're taking these i would say like you know we're taking these dangerous boxes around the country without fully understanding what how they can affect other species that are maybe native to that specific region 
and therefore us. Yeah, it's one more reason that we um, try to stay away from meddling in nature whenever possible. Um, so you then made the argument, which so many, I'll say, cultivated meat and fermented pr precision fermentation cheese companies make, which is, and plant-based companies make, which is, you know, no antibiotics in what we're doing, no hormones in what we're doing. So um, tell us, first of all, how you make Melly Bio Honey and what's the nutritional profile? What's in it? Yeah. Um, first of all, we, in terms of, we see that there are startups out there, you know, saying that they're either plant-based or, you know, cell-based, different approaches that they're taking. You know, we we took this approach that we want to make honey without bees and that we want to make real honey without bees. There's plenty of fake honey out there. There are many news about, you know, uh, samples being taken off the shelves of supermarkets in many countries and uh, for regulatory bodies finding fake honey. So let's, let's, let's now discuss what's real honey, what's fake honey, and how we're approaching this. So fake honey is made with water and some certain syrups. Very often it is rice syrup mixed with water, and then that solution is mixed with honey coming from the bees, and that product is finally sold in the supermarket. That comes very often. And in the United States, Europe, everywhere in the world, there there was also an affair called Honeygate or something like that. I think uh, there, was a, there was a TV show about that. So all those nasty things are happening. Many people are trying to trick consumers by telling them that they're selling honey coming from the bees, but it's just a blend. So with Mali Bio, we believe when that's the case, why, why shouldn't we take this approach? Let's learn, let's take science and let's learn how we can make real honey. Not rice syrup and sugary water, but real honey. And what real honey is, Real honey is sugars that are native to honey, acids that are native to honey, and all the other amazing stuff that come from the plants. So the beauty of honey and, and the power of honey, we, we like to say, is more coming from the plants than actually from the bees. And that is the approach that Mali Bayer is taking. We're making honey only from the products that, compounds that could be uh, found in honey, because otherwise, it's a honey alternative product. You know, you can take, you know, the, I saw on YouTube, there's like a bunch of people caramelizing sugar and adding water and be like, oh, I made this homemade vegan honey. That's a vegan honey alternative. And, you know, but that's not real honey. So what we are doing at Mali Bio is taking the approach that we want to have the product that's identical to the one that's coming uh, from the bees. And to make that happen, we have two approach. One is a plant-based approach. And one is precision fermentation approach. And right now, you know, we're working on those two. And at some point, those two will intersect because um, what I wanted to say is that very often startups see that in order to get a perfectly identical product to the animal analog, very often you need to use different technology approaches to actually get there. Okay. So let's talk about that. When you say it's plant-based, tell me exactly what's in it. So, and, then, and the nutritional profile, does it have yeah. B12 or I don't know? Tell me, tell me exactly. So nutritional profile and the ingredients are the same that you could see in honey if you would break down bee-made honey into ingredients. And I mentioned sugars. I'm talking about acids. There's a lot of water there, and there are uh, things coming from the plants. So basically, well, like what plant? Is there a specific plant that you use? different plants and that's the beauty of honey you know um, huh. we we you know we we went to some very interesting parts of the world in order to get um, compounds from plants that we desire that give a very unique taste texture and nutritional profile to honey so we've been working very hard on on, on our first you know batch that we manufacture at industrial scale my co-founder and I calculated, it took us 637 days since we shook hands until people were able to taste world's first real honey made without bees. So what is inside is identically the same what you would get inside of honey that's produced by the bees. And you know what? We were doing studies and we have some preliminary analysis reports showing that 
in terms of specific parameters, we're matching the ones that you know it's required for honey to match. So that's you know very exciting. Yeah, I think that is exciting because there's a particular note, a taste note to honey that uh, only honey has. I mean, like maple syrup doesn't have it. And yeah, there's honey is a very specific, I just want to say like a note. It's like a like a minor note. Like if you think of music, like major and minors, you've wow. got like that, that honey undertone that it's just not in anything else. Okay, but what about precision fermentation? What are you doing there? Um to, to your last point, uh, Elizabeth, and thank you for inspiring me on that. I would say Honey is a concert, you know. <laughs> we can have this amazing band. They have all the notes in place, but it's also about the room. It's also about how you hear, how you feel the sound. Honey is a complex, right? It's really hard to make it. You know, companies before us tried and were not able because they were taking the approach, which was not the hardest one. We took really hard approach, but that, that's paying off. And in terms of precision fermentation, um, we see uh, certain limits to the plant-based approach, which is mostly around the production cost of honey. Again, I did mention that the vision of Malibio is to make honey accessible for everyone. Honey is a premium product. Honey is a great product. What we believe that everyone should have equal access to that. Myself coming from a part of the world where was really hard growing up in, you know, former Yugoslavia, you know, going through two wars and not having food to buy in stores very often and just eating, you know, bread and sugar. I, at that time, I was hoping for the better world to come one day where I as a kid won't be thinking about if I have an access to a quality sweetener. So driven by that story too, I want everyone to be able to consume high quality, fantastic honey. But for that to happen, it needs to have the right price. And to have the right price, precision fermentation steps in because precision fermentation is an endless opportunity for the humankind to do something which is really important. And bear with me here. In order to make every next product produced in the world with a marginal cost close to zero, we need precision fermentation. Look what happened in the software industry. We you know, we have we need a bunch of money to produce an app, but every next user, the marginal cost of that next user is close to zero. We're going to do that with precision fermentation, and at that time, we'll be able to drive down the cost of our food to that level so that everyone will be able to have an access to it. And so when you're doing precision fermentation, you are going in and getting a specific gene that the honeybee has and you're mapping for lack of a better expression that gene onto a microbe that can again lack of a better expression can read it like cliff notes and start making the components to honey and then you add water or i'm not sure what you might add and then is that is that how it would go give or take yeah I, i'm really happy to talk about that because you know Talking about you know, our science is giving our customers a confidence that what we are doing here is something that really makes sense. So first of all, I'd like to start. I'd like to start saying that no bee is in involved in this process. So we're not taking any cells from any bee, uh, which you know might be case with you know some other industries that are working on removing the animal. So we're not interacting with any animal in this process. What we accomplished to do here, I'm really proud of my co-founder, who is an amazing scientist, who was able to design this approach where we, use, where we identified certain microorganisms that we are using in a way so that they create this fantastic environment of a, a honey stomach of a honeybee. So basically, again, it's we're looking into the nature and we are, again, using nature because microorganisms is nature around us. You know, you, you can look around, you can see walls, you can see tables, you can see screens, but you can also see microorganisms. So that's natural. So we're using one inspiration from nature uh, and other inspiration from nature to put it together in a story where we make honey without bees. Yeah, it's so fantastic. Um, it, it's just really exciting. I have a quick question before we pull out our honey and we start tasting it. Uh, and we talk about getting the cost down and all the people who've tried it and when you're going to be in market and how you're going to scale it, all this great kind of stuff. Um, just a, a quickie thing you had mentioned, no animals are harmed in the making of this 
honey. Just if you think like, oh, commercial farming doesn't impact the bees, it's that one queen bee. Maybe, maybe people don't know this. It's the one queen bee that gives birth to all of the bees. So she's artificially inseminated and this process of injecting her often kills her and often she has deformations and she, she who likes to go everywhere and fly everywhere, her, often her wings are clipped and she can't go anywhere. And you know, and, and then if, if she gets a disease, the entire hive will have one, et cetera. So lots of, lots of tricky business there with commercial farming of bees. Um, is, and I, what kingdom succeeded right. where the queens were being killed? Yeah. Tell me about that kingdom. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, well played, sir. Um, seems like we'll have to have a game of chess sometime. Yes, you are correct. Um, and and someone told me, again, I was talking to my beehiver friend, who's a beautiful person, by the way. Um, he was saying, oh, the bees have different personalities. And now that I've done more research with you, I'm wondering if the bees that he's buying to make honey uh, were actually different kinds of bees. So some bees are more aggressive than others. Um, or do I have that wrong? Do really bees have different personalities? I don't know if you have any information on this, but Specifically to that, I cannot speak about that, but what I can speak about is that there's a special dance that uh, bees take, it's called the Wiggle Dance, where they communicate to each other and the way how they position their bodies and the way how they wiggle is actually telling other bees where the food is. And I also read two studies about bees understanding the concept of zero. That's an interesting article. Um, and also I read a story about certain, it's it's not a very fortunate story, but it, it tells about the capabilities of bees. I think I read a story about certain military in the world using bees to train them to find explosives. So I was, I remember those two specific stories that, you know, blew me, blew me away. And, you know, bees, um, uh, I remember when I was visiting a lot of bee farms, I specifically think that I visited over 500 bee farms in my life. I remember that you know they don't like the odorants, so you need to approach them in a in a very specific specific way. And uh, if you have a, a little bit of stress, they also don't like that. So very uh, very peculiar species, wonderful species. And you know again, uh, additional reason for us to get ourselves out of the stigma of the knowledge that we have right now and accept what's happening out there and involve for the better. Because it is coming and we know it's coming because I've got it in my hot little hands. Okay, so here I is my, <laughs> let's, well, let's have a tasting party. Here's my Melly Bio yeah. honey. Everybody, I'm opening it right here so you can see, taking off my lid and show, look at that. Uh, and uh, I think Tom Vincel has asked, can you make baklava? Oh my God. Oh. So we're going to pull out the baklava about oh. four days ago. Look so, at that, people. So this is, can we make baklava? We like to show instead of instead of say. Yes, yes. Show. I'm sorry. I was busy eating my honey, people. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, show the baklava. Your wife made that for, I think, 100 people four days ago when you launched Meli Bio officially to the public. Look at that. So it bakes well. So it functions. Look at the, oh, it's delicious. I wish I had some of that. Mm. So uh, I, I, I really need to have one. I'm sorry. Yeah. I need to have one. Go ahead. Oh, so, so good. Oh my gosh. So this has the notes of honey that I was talking about, that undertone, that rich golden amber. It's like you're tasting amber. It's incredible. Um, when is this going to be for sale and how are you going to scale up? So answers to hard questions coming very soon i just yes, yeah, look at look at, look at everybody it looks so great oh for those of you listening on audio oh. honey dripper oh fantastic a classic honey dripper what so, a great scene here so Need this is honey. this is very exciting um if you would walk into a supermarket in every single product category from personal care food and beverage you'll find you would find at least one brand having honey and advertising that as a you know better for you option you'll find honey even in places like bourbon wet wipes shampoo okay. and of course talking about bars baked product honey is everywhere so we as a company 
want to be an enabler of and be out there for all the companies that are using honey or other sweeteners so that we can supply them with honey made without bees. So this is our idea. We're getting into market as a branded B2B business. We B2B. Have, we have, okay. We have branded B2B. The reason why I'm saying branded is that we we invested a lot of resources to make this happen. And we're ready to work with partners who are you know, ready to collaborate with us so that they can proudly say that they're using Mali Bios honey in, in their formulation. So right now we have 20 companies across the world that signed letter of intent. So very soon I'm expecting some exciting news to be announced about first partnerships and first products that people can buy that contain our honey. And would I know these companies? Definitely. Oh, I think, I think some, some of them are, you know, known to probably almost every person in the world. So this is very exciting, you know, for a startup that, you know, launched last year to be able to, uh, you know, move this fast, accomplish, you know, the process for a version one product and excite companies that, you know, they're so excited to, you know, validate this ingredient and launch products containing this ingredient. Yeah, this is really exciting. And I'm happy for you that they're going to co-brand, let you co-brand. I think that is really wonderful. Obviously very successful for Impossible Foods and Beyond Meat and when possible, I think it's great for brands to be able to do that. So how much Melly Bio can you make? What kind of quantity can you make? And what would a jar like this cost a restaurant or a consumer? I know you're B2B, but a B2C if that's ever possible. So, so fun fact, um, all the resources, all the money that was invested to get to the first jar of honey, which is like, this is like, uh, uh, this is like two or three ounces. So the, the, it took us $300,000 so to, to make that first one. Yes. However, a couple of weeks ago, we had a very successful um, scale up process where we took our, you know, small scale process into an industrial scale process. So right now we're able to make honey and deliver it in thousands of tons. In, in, tons. You know, in, in, in to, sorry, in thousands of pounds. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Sorry, um, thousands of tons will be coming probably in two years, but thousands of pounds right now, we can make this honey and you know, start, start you know, contracting contracts that go up to 40,000 pounds, which is one truckload of honey. That is awesome. That yeah. is so exciting. I will look for that. Give me a time frame for when I might see on a menu at a restaurant, for example, or in an ingredient list of a vegan cookie or something. I don't know. So, when will I see Melly Bio on these yeah. packs? You know, th thanks to this wonderful Melly Bio team, you know, we, we, we have more than 10 people right now working on Melly Bio. And, you know, thanks to their amazing energy and, and everything that they did for Melly Bio, I think we'll be seeing that rather sooner than later and very possibly this year. Oh, it's so exciting. Very possibly this year, 2021. Yeah. So right around the corner. And for those of you saying like, oh my God, you've taken my beef burger and now you want to take my honey. Don't look at it that way. This might be a way for you to get honey, not just for those who couldn't afford it before and now they'll be able to, but also as we were saying before, as uh, commercial bees reduce because they're too difficult on the native bee species, that means honey is reduced, which means the price goes up and it's difficult to get. So uh, this is a way to ensure everybody can have their honey and eat it too, which is so awesome. Uh, I've just got a couple of quick exit questions for you on the way out. Some of these might be like a sentence or two. Some will just be one word answers. Um, I think we maybe all know, know the answer to this, but I do want to hear it. Uh, if you could determine your legacy, what would that be? What would you like to be known for? As, as every human uh, on this planet in, in, you know, born in a 20th century and, and we'll be living through, through 21st century, there, there will be a lot of, a lot of um, you know, there will be a lot of resources, you know, taken. You know, during my life, I'll, I'll, I'll create a lot of, you know, potential, a lot of garbage. I'll be, you know, utilizing some scarce resources. So the way how I think about my life is that, I want to have a, a strong net positive result uh, for the better of this planet. Uh, otherwise, I would feel that there was another, another 
uneducated, uh, un not brave person using many of the resources out there to satisfy their own needs, desires, um, and you know the way of living. I really want to do something, and that something is you know creating the future of the food industry that helps our dear animals you know to survive and to live out there. And I want to be remembered like that. And um, you know that's. That's for me, it's very, very important. So um, this, um, this venture, this Malibio, you know, when, if we fail this, oh, and this is really emotional to us, um, failing with Malibio means that the world failed. And every person, every person that works with us, every, you know, advisor, every full-time, part-time employee contractor knows this. So they're giving their best so that we make the Mali bio the story of success that would mean that the planet Earth is the story of success and the humankind uh, too. Well, thank you for doing that, most definitely. And it is wonderful to have a mission aligned team. It's your sort of superpower that keeps you so fueled and so driven. Um, I'm wondering, what do you wish you knew 10 years ago that you know now? Uh, while the native bees and their story, Okay, which we discussed here today. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. That would have been right before you started in the commercial selling of honey. Um, okay, so you are having a very busy day. You're running around and you don't have time for lunch. What is your go-to snack? And it can't be Melly Bio Honey. Dates. Dates, oh, I love dates. Yeah, so you have a sweet tooth. I think we've determined that. <laughs> Um, okay, what, again, you're running around, but maybe things haven't gone your way. What is the phrase you tell yourself to get yourself back in the game? Uh, just breathe. Just breathe. Yeah, it's a good one. It's a good one. Rely on that a lot myself lately. Um, and my last question for you will probably be more than a one word answer. This can be about the bee industry or it can be larger. Actually, I'm going to put you in the hot seat. I'd like it to be both or at least the bee industry, but, but also both. What are your predictions for, let's say, the next three to five years, starting with the bee industry, but then also the entire you know, food supply system? Where do you see it going? Three to five years. It's always a hard task to um, foresee the future. So I'm going to talk about scenario that I'm really hoping for that to happen. So five years from, from now, most of the honey that's used into in B2B space will be honey created by science and sold by companies that are using science to make it not the not you know the bees. There will be honey at the farmers market. If you if someone would want to buy that jar of honey, that jar would probably cost hundred to hundred and fifty dollars, yeah. meaning that that product would be extremely extremely rare and 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 kind of really, really premium while all the honey that's being used and for ingredients will be vegan, will be plant-based because most of the food industry in five years will be a trending towards uh, that goal. Yes, um, I completely agree. And do you, do you see all, because five years is pretty short. Like if you look at, I mean, and, and you know, precision fermentation has yet to, let's say, produce a for fermented cheese that's, you know, so the, some, of, some of this technology is a little bit far out. Do you think we'll get a major shift to, I say plant-based, but I really mean um, a food mm -hmm. supply system without animals. Um, do you think we'll get to that without cultivated meat and precision fermentation? Um, it's going to take all three, isn't it? Yeah, I think, I think, Elizabeth, we need to be aware and be mindful about what has happened to the world in the last two years. So we cannot make judgments on the future based on the very peaceful, globally feel peaceful time. I think what's happening to the world is that shift is there and shift is happening on a faster pace than usual. So five years from now, the world will be looking like very different. And, you know, we already saw two years that changed almost everything, the way how we live, how we go to work, how we work, how we interact. And five years from now, it's going to be even more significant. And in a scenario where what I'm forecasting is happening, that will be a positive outcome. I don't want to think about those that not might not be this, so that they can, you know, reinforce the position of a negative scenario. I, I'm a, I'm an optimist.
Mm-hmm. I love that you are an optimist. You know, and something we didn't even talk about today is climate change and how that's also negatively impacting the native species of bees. I mean, in addition to pesticides, in addition to the pressure from the commercial farming of bees, et cetera. So, um, and bees are our planet really in the end. So I agree with you. Things are going to shift and they're going to shift fast for bees and for honey, but also for the rest of the entire global food supply system. Everybody, I don't think you can get Melly Bio on your site. It's not direct to consumer, even on your website, correct? No, it's not. It's not direct to consumer. However, I do invite all the chefs and all the people that are professionally involved in preparing food. I invite all the companies that are, you know, iterating with new ingredients to approach to us, and we'll be more than happy to, you know, provide samples and work together in making our honey really building perfectly into their products. Because as I did show um, previously, but I'm going to show again, baklava, one of the most honey forward meals is, yeah. is made with Mali Bio honey and vegan butter by Bioko. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a perfect product. It's really amazing. And, you know, that's the power of honey. It goes together with others, forming something that's delicious and, and tasteful and something that's even more than honey. And again, Mali Bar is about honey, about bees, and moreover, it's about us and our future. I love it. Everybody go to melebio.com. I want you to read that state of the bees report. So informative. You'll learn a lot about bees, uh, how particular they are and how important they are and the many different kinds and the stresses that they're under and how critical it is to our welfare as a planet and a people um, and our food sources. So lots of great news from you, Darko Mandich. I am so grateful for all that you do. Thank you for bringing us the only brand of honey without the bees by by the way, the very only one. So thank you for that um, ingenuity. And of course, it's also Dr. Aaron Schaller, your co-founder and uh, partner, who's a great scientist and you, the lover of bees, putting out the product. Thank you both. Darko, don't go away. Everybody else, thanks, thanks for being with me on Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, and Twitter. I will see you all next Tuesday. Darko, stay put. Everybody, thanks for all you do.